So that takes us to lesson 10, which is the start of uh, the New Testament. And really a lot of stuff going on. I'm trying to just condense it into small manageable pieces. Um, this map, I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, So just a little bit of a recap before we, before we get going. Um, and I think it was lesson two, we talked about a real brief history of what was going on with the Jews. Um, um, through the through the Old Testament and then in that period between uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament and in the next lesson we're going to talk more about um, the about the New Testament uh, history and what's going on and when the epistles were written and all that stuff but that's next lesson right now I just want to kind of show what's going on uh, at the start of the New Testament um, so uh, Persia takes over in 530 in 539 and says okay uh, you guys can return home in 538. The Jews actually go home. Now, not all of them, though. Uh, the first group of them. Um, then, in fast forward past Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, past all that, past uh, um, uh, the last of the prophets, uh, Alexander the Great comes by and takes over and and beats beats Persia and everything. This is in the 330s that he that he makes it over here. Um, but right after conquering everything, he dies, uh, and his his empire is broken up between his generals, and it's just kind of nothing really important for our study. Um, anyways, long story short, after uh, tiffs as to who rules what for a while, um, there is the Maccabean Revolt, or with the uh, Hasmonean Dynasty and all that, where the Jews basically say, "Hey, we're we've had enough of this," and they break away. Um, and then that takes us to the books of, of the Maccabees from um, the extra biblical books, the books that that happen between the Old and New Testament but are not part of the Bible. Um, and a bunch of different things happen. Not really important for the for our study, but long story short, uh, Rome comes in to help. Kind of, I don't know. Whatever you want to say there. Now, a lot of different opinions as to as to how to correctly say that. But basically, there's this there's this tiff between the Maccabees and um, the Hasmoneans, whatever. Um, and Rome comes in and just kind of takes over. So that's in 63. Um, Herod the Great, just a lot of different things going on with him. Um, you know, he, he ruled uh, in a couple different areas, had some things going on with, with um, some of the different emperors that are just kind of important and cool to know, but not really important for our study. Long story short, around 40 or so, uh, he becomes the, the king of the Jews. He, he uh, uh, is appointed over um, the Jewish place, and I think it's in 37 that he conquers Jerusalem. I, I don't remember exactly, though. Um, so then he's he's known as the king of the Jews. So then by the time of the gospel where it says about uh, Jesus being born, obviously he's very nervous about this. Um, and so Jesus is born in about 6 uh, BC. Um, and within Jesus' like second birthday, I think it is, uh, Herod the Great dies. Which honestly isn't that bad of a thing. He was, he was just a terrible person. Um, he, a psychopath, for lack of... of, of well, I think that word summarizes pretty great, just a psychopath. And there are some problems with his will. I think he had six wills or something like that. I don't really remember. But um, long story short, his his area there is broken up between uh, uh, three of his sons, Archelaus, Antipas, and Philip, in 4 BC. But by uh, 4 or 6 AD, and I, I forget which, um, Archelaus is exiled for incompetence. He's like, no, we're not gonna we're not gonna have him be here anymore. Um, and so this area right here where Archelaus was um, is now under what's called a procuratorship, which basically means, long story short, way oversimplifying here, Roman governors, which is where we get Festus and Felix and um, Pontius Pilate. Those are all the people who – those are all different people who, who ruled um, in, in Jerusalem. So, uh, yeah. Um, and then his other sons, Antipas and Philip, they reign into the uh, all the way into the 30s um, AD. Um, I don't remember exactly when. I think 37 
and 39 or something like that. But anyways, here's Antipas's uh, area here and here. And Philip has this area over here. Let me move my webcam here. You can see uh, Philip's domain there. Okay. Um, so that that's kind of how it breaks up. But then um, uh, I think it's um, Antipas dies first, I think. Uh, it's been a while since I studied this. One of them dies, and um, they don't really replace him for another year, a couple years, and that's kind of something that you see happen. Um, when one of them dies, it, it takes a while before someone is placed back in um, control or command or whatever you want to say. Anyways, one of them dies, and the other one only only lives a few years later. Um, in fact, I have it written down right here. Um, Well, I guess it's not important. Okay, Philip uh, reigns until 34, and Antipas reigns until 39. Um, and I don't remember if they're killed or if, or if they die or if they're just exiled. I don't really remember. Um, but long story short, that that's kind of what happens there. Um, and we don't really run into another Herod until Herod Agrippa I in 37 AD which is the Herod Agrippa in the, in the Book of Acts that dies in the 40s somewhere. And then after a couple years, I think it's like three or four years, uh, Agrippa II um, comes to, comes to, or is placed in power, and that's in about 50 AD. Um, so really, the one thing that's for certain, and I want you to kind of get from all this, I know that's kind of confusing. It's It gets even more confusing if you actually try and study it. Um, what happens is... The Israel of, of Palestine, Israel, whatever you want to call it, is in a constant state of unrest. All the way from, um, from Persia, allowing them to go back, all the way past Jesus. Um, starting with Persia, they, they had some problems with the Samaritans that we talked about, and that's just a constant tiff. Um, a lot of opposition in rebuilding Jerusalem. And then, uh, you know, you have Alexander the Great's generals constantly bickering over who's in control of it. Then you have the, the Maccabean Revolt, which really didn't solve much. I mean, it, I guess in some ways it solved some things, but really just a, a cluster cuss there, too. So then you have the Ro uh, them, you know, have war with themselves eventually, and then uh, Roman com uh, the, uh, Rome coming in, and there's still a bunch of different... Uh, 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 rebellions and whatnot going on until after Jesus and in, in the late 60s, um, early 70s, there's another Jewish rebellion, which is when um, the temple is destroyed in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is destroyed. Um, uh, the the fortress of Masada is taken over. Uh, uh, the Qumran community, which was where those monks were, that's destroyed, which is actually where we get the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, but anyways. Uh, and, and just a lot of different stuff happening, constant turmoil, constant unrest, which is one of the big things, uh, big themes in the Gospels, um, which takes us to the, to the New Testament. Um, at the, when Rome took over, um, it was a thing with, 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 for, well, yeah, it was a thing with Greek culture, um, but it was very much still, still, so, very much still a thing. Very much so is still a thing with Rome, um, the the mixed match religion, religions. Um, it wasn't just a part of like oh there's a church over there. It was it was a thing of it was part of the culture. There were all these different religions. Uh, there were all these different gods to worship. There were all these different festivals, and you and you celebrated them in order to be a part of the community. Um, it was it was. Um, it was anti-government to do to not do those things. Like for instance, um, the emperor had to be had to be uh, worshipped as savior and lord, um, and uh, obviously that that would conflict with with what the Christians believed later on, um, and obviously caused some friction there. Um, and really just a lot – I can't really get through the, all of them, but there's just a lot of different religions going on. However, Rome gave the Jews a kind of special treatment in that they saw, okay, we'd rather not have a rebellion, so we'll just allow the Jews to have their you know, their whole monotheism thing, whatever. See what I mean? Um, and 
just kind of allowing them to have that and trying to calm the calm rebellions. It didn't really work because the Jews just kept rebelling. Um, I'm not picking sides as to who was right or who was wrong. I'm just saying it was a constant thing of unrest in, in the uh, Israel area. Um, so because of all this, there the Jews kind of worked up a strong sense of racism. Um, they were racist against the Samaritan, uh, Samaritans because of all, all the different uh, tiffs that they had, had all the way from when they when they migrated back to the land of Israel um, all the way to, to the days of Jesus, you know, just going back and forth. And, and I mentioned this before, how the Jews destroyed the Samaritans' uh, uh, temple. Um, excuse me. So the, obviously there, there's tension there, but then there's also tension between them and, and the Greeks because um, – or, or the Gentiles, I should say uh, – because of, of the defilement of the temple, because they worshipped a bunch of different gods, and, and, and they just saw it as, as totally um, uh, unfair, un, un, unholy. They just saw it as a very – kind of thing, you know, um, a very um, anti uh, their beliefs. It was just went against everything that they believed. Um, and so the uh, tensions were kind of high when Jesus was born, um, or came into the world, I guess you could say. Um, and so as a result, the Jews are looking for this earthly kingdom. They're looking for the Messiah to come and just set everything right. The Jews will once more be in, in, in control of themselves, no more um, overlords. And they would go and just push back the other nations, and, and it would be great. Except that's not the way Jesus did it. Um, and so obviously there's there's times when when when... Um, the, what the Jews think is going to happen and what Jesus says is going to happen is, is kind of confusing people. Like, ooh, what's going on? Um, and so there's just a lot of tension there. Um, another thing to take into account is the fact that um, at this time, in this place, there was a very much so a strong honor-shame society. In America, it's not really the case. Um, you may feel guilt about something or you may feel shamed for something, but then it passes. But at this time... Honor and shame was a way bigger deal. Um, um, to be rejected um, and bring dishonor on your family was a really big deal. Um, we see this in the story of the prodigal uh, son, where the father at the end runs towards the son. A very dishonorable thing um, for him to have done that. Uh, and it's a very dishonorable how the, how the son asked for that money or demanded that money, basically saying, I wish you were dead. Um, just you know, real big, uh, real big factor at at the times at the time of this is the honor shame society. Um, but I mean, you can find out more about that in, in in history books and whatnot. I don't really want to waste time on that. Um, and there's a lot. Really, America is a um, is just a giant mixing pot of different cultures. Um, I'm sure you can find out more about that um, from people. Uh, and actually, in the Middle East, um, if I'm correct, I believe that honor shame society is still kind of a thing there. So, um, anyways, <clears throat> so then there's some a couple different groups or, or sects, if you want to call them that. Um, the first is called zealots. These are basically anti-Roman radicals, anti-government. Really, um, they didn't believe in anyone um, ruling over Israel. You know, just real um, extremists, basically. Um, really making this very simple. Uh, there's a lot more that could be said about all this, but I'm just trying to keep to, to the simplest of things here. Um, <clears throat> the next group is called the Essenes, which are basically monks. I mean, that's the easiest way to clarify what they did. Um, they're responsible for the um, Dead Sea Scrolls. They're responsible for um, the kind of separatistic living where they where they withdrew to their to their places because the world was just so evil. Um, and there was a group called the Sadducees, which was a small group, the same as the Pharisees were not a very large group. Um, the Sadducees were kind of dependent on the Roman rule, and after uh, Jerusalem is destroyed, the Sadducees the Sadducees Sadducees just kind of die out. Uh, the Pharisees adapt to the new setting because that's what they were um, formed to do. But the Sadducees were so dependent on on, on um, political power plays and, and 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 wealth and whatnot that that when Jerusalem was destroyed, it just kind of that's the end of the Sadducees. Um, so uh, they were rich. Uh, there were, like I said, just a few of them. They rejected the supernatural things. Um, uh, 
in, in, the, in one of the Gospels, they asked Jesus a question about the resurrection, which is funny because they didn't even believe in that. Um, so, uh, then there was the Pharisees, once again, another small group, uh, very law-oriented. They, they tried to, their goal was to preserve the law in whatever context. The, it's 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 kind of up in the air as to where they first came from, but just basically think of it as somewhere after Persia allows Israel to go back to the Promised Land, They're, or maybe even formed while still in Babylon. I don't know. Somewhere back there was the earliest roots of them, and then they just kind of developed into what we know as the Pharisees by the time of the Gospels. Um, so, so their goal was to preserve the law, whatever the context. So, as a result, they were able to 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 adapt to the different um, uh, different uh, settings and whatnot. Um, and so, when when Jerusalem is destroyed in 70 A.D., the Pharisees still exist, and they just move their base to somewhere else. Um, let me think. Was there anything else? Um, that's probably about it. Um, so as you can see, just a lot of different different things going on uh, at the time of Jesus. A lot of different tension in the land. A lot of different, um, just a lot of different things going on. So that brings us to the Gospels. Um, and there's four Gospels in in your Bible. Uh, gospel means good news, um, the story of Jesus. There's four accounts of Jesus: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, why it says Luke Acts there is because Luke and Acts are written as as um, well, two books, but one kind of theme. They're, they're connected, kind of like how Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy was. Okay, you just kind of see it as that. Kind of repeats on the same themes together. They kind of just um, part A and part B. It's like if you're reading a book and it has two parts to it. You know, uh, Or like Lord of the Rings. You read Fellowship of the Ring and then you read, read the Two Towers. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's connected. Um, so there, the first group of the Gospels, which consist of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called the Synoptic Gospels, which, long story short, this basically means that they've got a lot of content that's very similar to one another. If you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, it's gonna there's going to be some of the same stories. Uh, Jesus is going to say some of the things in the same ways, whereas if you read John, it's just totally a totally different thing. Um, but anyways, uh, and so that brings up the question, who were the 12, 12 disciples of, of Jesus? Well, first off, let me let me uh, state this: that none of the twelve disciples were related to Jesus, and the John who wrote the Gospel of John was also not related to Jesus. Um, Jesus didn't even have a brother named John. Um, so, anyways, uh, there's Peter, also called Simon. There's Andrew, James, and John, both sons of Zebedee. There's Philip, Bartholomew, also called Nathaniel. Um, there's Thomas, there's Matthew, who's also called Levi, there's James, there's Thaddeus, also called Judas, there's Simon, and then there's Judas Iscariot, which is later replaced by Matthias. I know that's confusing, but um, the different Gospels call them by different names. <laughs> and only some of them get the same names in, in all the Gospels, or in the different Gospels that mention them. Um, really the most important ones, or I shouldn't say the most important ones, but um, the ones that, that um, are mentioned the most is, is Peter and John. Um, and they're kind of the ones that are, that are mentioned the most. Uh, so, um, Jesus had, uh, it's unclear as to whether Jesus' father uh, was alive at the time of his ministry. Um, we can assume that he wasn't because um, it would have been dishonorable for Jesus to have gone into ministry when his father was still um, um, doing his work uh, where, where Jesus wasn't helping him. That would have been kind of dishonorable. Um, and he's also not mentioned in the Gospels. So, I mean, it's been the assumption that he's dead before Jesus goes into ministry, but we don't really know one way or another. Um, he's got his mother, Mary. Um, then he's got, I believe, three or four brothers. Um, one's called Judas, who wrote, who wrote, um, wrote the book of Jude um, in your Bible. Um, then there's J um, um, John. No. Oh, I wish I could remember their names. Um, mm. Well, anyways. Um, and then he's got, um, I believe, one or two sisters. Um, so 
he does have a bit of family. However, as far as we can tell, none of his family believed in him until after the resurrection. Um, like, uh, one of his brothers is James, who is a different James than the Twelve. Um, I'll get into this in the next lesson. Um, I can see that this is just going to take up too much time if I try to explain it now. Um, but uh, um, as far as we can tell, Jesus' uh, brothers and sisters did not believe in, in him until after his resurrection. Um, so, anyways, what made Jesus so different was because the spiritual leaders of Jesus' time had, had this whole religion thing worked down to a science. They had it all figured out, and they had this whole holier-than-thou, um, we've got all the spiritual answers thing. But when Jesus came, he put God back into the religion. He made it about God again. And um, he used creative teachings. He used, he used all these different things that caused people to have to think. He didn't just say things. He used extremes. He used parables. He, he used stories. He used all these different things to draw people in to a, a real and meaningful relationship to God. Um, and just really uh, tried to play on – not play. That's the wrong word. Uh, really tried to – Point people back to restore a uh, restoration with God, um, so he just got rid of the jargon that the people were so used to. Um, and don't forget that the Bible of the um, of Jesus and of the uh, New Testament Church it was the Old Testament, okay. And the New Testament is based on the Old Testament. Remember that. Just because Jesus fulfilled the law does not mean that there is no application for us today in the law. I hope that that makes sense. Um, yeah. So, when reading the Gospels, first off, notice that the stories are connected. Um, I'll get into this again when I get to Luke, um, but uh, for now, just realize that it's not a bunch of different stories. The stories are related, and the stories are, 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 are placed in an order that tell a story. That makes sense? So, I'll kind of elaborate that on, on Luke. Um, well, no, I'll, I'll mention it now. In Luke, for instance, uh, he traces Jesus' um, genealogy or his birth line all the way back to Adam, as in the first man, Adam, showing that Jesus was fully human. But then in the very next part, it goes to Jesus' temptation, showing that Jesus was fully human but without sin. See, he said he, – he taught something that Jesus was fully human but without sin just simply by the order of events, how he ordered his gospel. Does that make sense? Um, so then, um, also, uh, not everything Jesus ever did is recorded. Okay. Also, they used their own words. If you compare the Gospels, Jesus doesn't say things in the same way. Why? Because different writers were writing it. And in that culture at that time, that was acceptable practice. Basically, you had to retain the essence of what the person was saying while using your own words and clarifying what the person was saying. See what I mean? That's how they wrote back then. So um, are they the exact words that Jesus said sometimes? But sometimes they are um, the essence of what Jesus was saying. And so the words – the very words that the, that the uh, writers of the gospel used are very important. Because they picked and chose those, reason, those words for a reason to maintain the essence and the character of what Jesus was saying or the exact words that Jesus was saying, depending on which. Um, as far as what, what did Jesus speak, um, he definitely spoke Greek. Um, but then it's kind of a matter of debate as to whether he spoke Aramaic or Hebrew or whatever. Um, it seems how Hebrew was kind of becoming a thing of the past. People were kind of losing it at that time, um, which is why um, the, God, uh, the Old Testament was translated into Greek called the Septuagint. It's just kind of um, hard to imagine Jesus talking in Hebrew, but he, he could have. Um, in fact, when he says a few things on the cross, some people don't even know what he's talking about. Anyways. Long story short, let's go to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew was written uh, probably sometime in the 60s by one of the 12 disciples um, whose name was Levi, also called Matthew. 
Um, and so he was he was with Jesus for a lot of this. As far as who the audience is for Matthew, it has a very Jewish tint to it. Um, Matt, the Gospel of Matthew was written to the people who came from a Jewish background but had believed in Jesus. So the new Jews, if you will. Um, I mean, I know that's a kind of vulgar way of describing it, but I think it kind of gets the point across um, as separating them from the Jews who still held to the law. Um, he used Mark as a source for his writings, the same as Luke did. Um, but it's got a very much so Jewish emphasis. If you know, if you look, the le the Jewish leaders are looked at very in a in a very negative light, um, very negative tone for them. Um, Jesus, he goes to great lengths to so to show Jesus as a teacher, as 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 a, as a rat as a rabbi. You know, he, you have Matthew, which is a, a, a breakup of five important speeches. Um, for Jesus, so it just shows him as this teacher who has this wisdom to give, very Jewish feel, kind of bringing back the prophets and the uh, wisdom literature from the New, from the Old Testament, um, someone who revived that. But it also shows him as, as coming from David. If you look at uh, the genealogy in um, Matthew, it goes to um, Abraham, showing the way that Jesus fulfilled uh, the promise. But it gives it gives emphasis to uh, who is in that genealogy. Um, and also um, that he did come from David. It's kind of like a, an important thing. That the king, the one we've been looking for, this is him. So it's just a very strong Jewish feel. Mark is the oldest of the Gospels, being written as early as in the 40s, which if Jesus died in the 30s, we're talking about being written within 10 or 15 years. Um, really, the, the, the oldest of, of the Gospels, which both Matthew and Luke used as a source, it was it was written technically by John Mark, who was not one of the twelve, but he preserved what Peter um, P, what Peter recollected. Um, so kind of was written by Peter in a way. Um, probably Peter was just told John Mark what to write, um, which this John Mark was the same Mark that um, Paul in. On his second missionary trip, says, "Hey, uh, Barnabas, I don't want to take Mark with us because uh, he deserted us in our first trip." Um, uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can read through um, Acts. Um, I want to say it's probably somewhere around like somewhere around chapter like 16 or something. I don't know, somewhere around there. But anyways, um, <clears throat> so okay. And obviously Peter was one of the closest of the uh, disciples. It was written to a Roman audience, um, very kind of to the point about stuff, whereas in some areas he adds more detail than in other areas. Like, for instance, he'll say the green grass instead of just saying the grass. You know what I mean? He'll add a little bit of detail, which is funny because it's like the shortest of the Gospels, and it's very to the point about stuff. Um uh, people have noticed um, in Mark Jesus' failures more. Like, for instance, um, there's a demon that doesn't instantly come out when he tells it to. Um, you know, there's just kind of that, that – it makes it a little bit more drawn out, which kind of emphasizes, emphasizes – <laughs> puts emphasis <laughs> uh, to Jesus' human side. Um, not that Jesus failed, but that there was a um, – you know, that human element where he had to – uh, pray through things rather than um, instantly demons coming out just because he's the son of God. Uh, kind of an important point for Mark. However, this has caused a lot of people to then co go to the extreme of saying, well, Mark didn't believe that Jesus was God. Well, no. If you read Mark through, he goes to great extents to show that Jesus is also God. For instance, how he introduces him, how he talks about him through the through the um, through his gospel, the titles that he gives to Jesus, and also um, the way that that Jesus uh, crucifixion climaxes. If you just read through that and compare it to Old Testament, it's very obvious that Mark is strongly saying explicitly and implicitly that Jesus is God. The only people who would resolve to a conclusion that Mark didn't think that Jesus was God is someone who's just trying to disprove Jesus, not someone who's actually relying on facts. Um, as far as uh, what ending did, was the original ending in Mark's gospel, well, there's three different endings, so it's kind of hard to know for sure. But the original ending uh, was probably the shortest one, the very first one in your Bible. Um, uh, 
And the reason why is because Mark was trying to show the failures of the disciples. And so if it ended like this, and they all ran away scared, what a heavy emphasis to, to, to really the facts of, of Jesus has done his thing. He has conquered, and still the disciples are, 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 are see what I mean, kind of trying to motivate people to do things, to, to, to go out there and, 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 and uh, obey. Um, and obviously this was written to, to a Roman audience. Um, that would have been while Peter was in Rome uh, and Mark was with him. Um Okay, so why the secret? Why? How come in, in the Gospel of Mark, he's always telling people not to say anything about him being God or you know stuff like that? Well, there's three reasons. The first is because of, because the demons who proclaimed who he was, uh, that's a bad witness. You don't really want Satan's minions, you know, saying yes, believe in this guy. Oh yeah, thanks for that seal of approval. Uh, the second was because of healings. Jesus uh, didn't want an overcrowded ministry. He didn't want people following him just for uh, the things that he could offer. He wanted them to be drawn into a relationship with God. Um, and the third reason was uh, because the disciples didn't understand who he was, they still thought Jewish mindset that he was going to establish a human kingdom, an earthly kingdom here on earth, and they didn't understand. And so Jesus told them not to say anything um, so that they would later understand. So that takes us to the Gospel of Luke. Uh, written in the early 60s. Um, it's written to a, a man named Theophilus, a very wealthy um, Greek person. It's got a very it's got a very different feel to it. He describes some things a lot differently. Um, for, just to show you kind of the differences, um, on the story um, between some of the Gospels, on, on, on the story where the man is lowered through the roof um, to, uh, to be healed by Jesus in the crowded house, um, one gospel says that it was, um, I think it was like tiles or something like that, and the other one says that it was something else. Well, which one is it? Well, they were relating what they were saying to the audience. They didn't lie. They just, see what I mean? Does that make sense? They put it in words that they would understand. If I describe something that you've never seen, wouldn't it just be easier to relay it to something that you have seen? Let's say, for instance, I had chickens, but where you come from, you only see, you only have uh, turkeys, and you've never even seen a chicken. You've never even heard of a chicken, for instance. Let's say I just say, okay, well, I've got a bunch of turkeys. So you know what I mean, where I'm trying to relay something to you that, that correctly, it, the story stays the same. Nothing has changed in the story. It's just a detail has been uh, modified for the for the real, original audience to understand. Instead of tiles, it's something else. Well, it, the essence is still the same. They went through the roof. Why would the gospel writer have said, oh, and by the way, this is how they build houses over there. And this is how you guys build houses over here. And it why is that important? Why not just say he went through the tiles? See what I mean? So some people hop on a train of so, trying so rapidly to disprove the Gospels that they kind of give themselves over to stupidity. Um, Luke used eyewitness accounts. He was not one of the twelve. He was not one of the twelve. Um, we don't even know when he, when he was saved. Maybe maybe Paul was the one who originally brought the gospel to him. Um, either way, um, he he talked to people. He used the, he used um, the other gospels that were, that had been written at the time. He he, you know, really, um, well, uh, got the full story. Think of him as a journalist or a reporter. Although um, it's common tradition that he was a doctor. Um, and this uh, gospel is one unit with Acts. So if you read Luke, try and read Acts along with it because they really um, have the same themes that go through it. Um, um, he has a strong emphasis on the outcast, the women, the the Samaritans, the, the 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 poor. You know, if you read through Luke, he emphasizes those things way more than the other Gospels. Um, you see the Holy Spirit in it, um, especially in, in Luke Acts. You know, you see just a strong emphasis on the Holy Spirit, people being filled, baptized, led by. You see the Holy Spirit is a key. Um, key character. Um, also, you see history. Um, Luke was very concerned with maintaining um, the the historical um, setting of things. But then also, uh, you see the idea of stewardship. If you have money, use it wisely. If you have this, use it wisely. You just kind of have this theme repeated in Luke about the responsibility of those who have something to provide for those who don't have it. If you have food to spare, give it to those who don't. See what I mean? Um, 
So that takes us to, to the Gospel of John, written surprisingly later than the other Gospels, sometime between 81 to 96 somewhere. Um, written by John, who was one of the twelve and was one of the three closest to, to um, Jesus. It's written to Asia Minor, which if you look on this map here, is right there. Here's Israel here, and here's Turkey here, and so there's Asia Minor. Um, you see a strong emphasis on, on love, 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 love in John. And you're going to see that John, the Gospel of John, um, contrasts with 1 John, which we'll talk about when we get to 1 John. Um, and, and as far as the Holy Spirit, you see the Holy Spirit mentioned as the next step in Christianity. Uh, throughout the Gospel of John, he's always saying, okay, this is for now, and then the Holy Spirit. I'm going to go so that I can send the Holy Spirit. Um, and also you see with John, he's not so concerned about... Um, showing Jesus human side he's trying only to show Jesus God's side if you read through the Gospel of John it becomes very obvious that Jesus is fully God um, on equal terms with the Father he's this maybe a different person in the Trinity but still so a part of the Trinity um, so there's only one God um, <clears throat> so that takes us to uh, the kind of uh, outline of Luke Acts. If you look through Luke Acts, you kind of have this. This, or if you remember me talking about chiasms, and I have an appendix um, in these videos talking about uh, chiasm again. Um, so there's uh, Jesus is born in Roman history. You kind of he sets it in the Roman context. Paul is preaching in Rome. Uh, Jesus in Galus and Galilee, the uh, the church throughout the Gentile world. Jesus in Samaria and Judea, and Judea um, the Christians in Judea and Samaria. Uh, Jesus in Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem. And then in the, in the center of that, we had the resurrection and the ascension. Um, what changed Peter from the person who denied Jesus into the person who proclaimed him and, 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 and 3,000 people were saved in a single day? The empowerment of the Holy Spirit to witness. Um, so, um, if there's any questions, please post them below and I will do my very best to, honor, to answer them uh, in a very clear way. Thank you very much for your time.